Peace and greetings, everyone. My name is Born Logic Allah. I am the co-founder of Melanized Media, where we produce highly educational, culturally enriching black films and online presentations. And I'm coming to you today because we have a special offer um, that we're pushing and that we're promoting at the end of the year, the end of 2020. We've seen a lot this year. And one thing that we've noticed and understood is that the education of ourselves, the learning about our history, black history, is of the utmost importance. Educating our children, experiencing these things with our family, and expanding the information that we can consume and enrich our lives with. So what we've done is we've put together a six-pack presentation, a six-pack bundle of, of some of our most popular films and presentations this year. We've packaged them in a one-time bundle. We're calling it a six-pack Black History Presentation Bundle, and it is going for $19.99. You will get six feature-length films and presentations, all for $19.99. That's an unbeatable price. We hope that you take advantage of it. Right now, what we're going to do is show you clips and pieces of those presentations so that you get a taste for what you're purchasing. We're about to show you over an hour of footage to help you make this very easy purchasing decision. Have a positive and productive day. Peace. The lynching of Black America, an online presentation by Melanize Media. In this presentation, the lynching of Black America. You may find some of the information and images disturbing and painful. Our intent is not to be crass or insensitive, but to reveal the truth about the brutality and horrors of lynching. A history looking at the origin, purpose, and impact of lynching on Black America. African history does not begin with slavery and lynching. Dr. Malifi Kete Asante says that 400 years of enslavement cannot erase 4 million years of humanity and contributions to the world. We must acknowledge African humanity. Africans are the mothers and fathers of humanity and civilization. They built great nations such as Nubia, Egypt, Ghana, Mali, Great Zimbabwe, and others. African people were farmers, scientists, teachers, government officials, skilled men and women, husbands and wives. Enslaved Africans were brought to America to help build a nation. Not slaves, but human beings with history culture and skills. The true origins of black lynchings, the enslavement of Africans, falsification of black history, destruction of black culture, dehumanization of black people, and the growth of white supremacy were the first and most significant steps in the lynching of black America. We must understand that you must first assassinate the character and image of a people in order to authorize the killing of their bodies and minds. Uh, psychologically, if you understand the mentality of human beings, it is, it is validly, it is extremely necessary for us to dehumanize people mentally before we cause harm to them physically. So the assassination of character is important for us as people, as human beings, to justify murder, torture, and terror. The enslavement of Africans from 1515 to 1808, European leaders, clergymen, and merchants sanctioned and legalized the enslavement of African people. In 1452, Pope Nicholas V issued a public decree permitting, quote, perpetual servitude of the pagans and heathens in Africa, basically giving his blessings of the enslavement of Africans and the taking of their lands. 
It is estimated that 15 to 75 million African lives were lost through mass murder in the Ma'afa, the African Holocaust of enslavement. Dr. David Stannard, professor of American studies, estimated that some 30 to 60 million Africans died being enslaved. He estimated a 75 to 80 percent mortality rate in transit. According to the Equal Justice Initiative, 4,084 African Americans were lynched between 1877 and 1950. Lynching is the premeditated murder committed by a group of people by extrajudicial action. The murder, usually by hanging of individuals by a mob action without trial and knowledge of the truth. A public display of violent torture and murder. A public execution of individuals for an alleged crime. An act of terrorism whose perpetrators are never held accountable. We summarize lynching as a form of violence in which a mob under the pretext of administering justice without trial executes a presumed offender often after inflicting torture and corporal mutilation. When we speak of lynching most people think of hanging but lynching means much more. Victims of lynching were also killed in a variety of other ways. Shot repeatedly, burned alive, forced to jump off a bridge, dragged behind cars. Sometimes they were tortured Sometimes their body parts were removed and sold as souvenirs in stores. Hanging can be an aspect of lynching, but lynching is much more than just hanging. The origin of lynching. The terms lynching and lynch law are believed to be derived from Charles Lynch, a Virginia politician and patriot who headed an unauthorized court in Virginia to punish supporters of the British during the American Revolutionary War. Lynch law refers to an organized but unauthorized punishment of criminals. Prior to the Civil War, many of the victims of hanging in the South were white men. In the 1800s, on the Western frontier, Mexicans, Chinese, Native Americans, and whites were hanged. The origin of lynching and African Americans. During slavery on the plantation, enslaved Africans were worked, whipped, beat, tortured, mutilated, and killed. With the end of physical bondage in 1865, the brutality and murder of free blacks continued. Although the practice of lynching had existed before and during slavery, the lynching of blacks gained momentum during Reconstruction when African Americans began to make political and economic inroads by registering to vote, establishing businesses, and running for public office. Um, the amount of progress that we showed through and that we uh, obtained as a people during Reconstruction is amazing. I mean, straight out of chains and being considered property, we were able to um, elevate into society and immerse ourselves in business, education, um, political power. Um, even though people were appointed um, to government positions during that time, during Reconstruction, we as a people were able to handle it. And we were thriving. And that progress that we achieved, that thriving that we were experiencing was met with the repercussions of death and persecution. That is literally how our nation has systematically, historically dealt with our progress is through killing us. The goals and purpose of lynching to maintain racial control and domination, 
to enforce Jim Crow laws and racial segregation, to terrorize and prevent the rise of black people, to maintain white supremacy in the economic, social, and political sphere. Benjamin Tillman, a former governor and U.S. Senator from South Carolina, said on the floor of the Senate in 1900, we of the South have never recognized the right of the Negro to govern white men, and we never will. And we will not submit to his gratifying his lust on our wives and The Birth of a Nation is a 1915 American silent epic drama film. The film portrays African Americans, many of whom are played by white actors in blackface, as unintelligent and sexually aggressive toward white women. The film presents the Ku Klux Klan as a heroic force necessary to preserve American values and a white supremacist social order. The film has been acknowledged as an inspiration for the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan and the lynching of black America. your grandfather's hands that forged civilization and it was your grandmother's hands who rocked the cradle of civilization one night in Omaha Nebraska when my mother was pregnant with me a party of hooded clansmen on horses galloped up to our house with their shotguns and rifles. They surrounded our house and they shouted for my father to come out. My mother went to the front door and opened it wide so they could see her pregnant condition. She told them my father was away in Milwaukee preaching. The Klansmen shouted threats and warnings, saying that we better get out of town because the good Christian white folks were not gonna stand by and let my father spread trouble among the good Negroes of Omaha, Nebraska with that back to Africa preaching of Marcus Garvey. My mother and father were Garveyites. They was followers of the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey. My father his name was Earl Little. He was born in Reynolds, Georgia. Four of my father's five brothers were murdered by whites. See, my father was a tall, dark-skinned black man. He was a Baptist minister and a preacher for the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. He wanted to organize the people to follow Marcus Garvey. See, my father believed as Marcus Garvey believed that the Negro must return to Africa to achieve freedom, independence, and self-respect. As a little boy, I went to some of those meetings, those Garvey meetings with my father. And I remember hearing Africa for Africans, Ethiopians awake, up you mighty race, 
you can accomplish what you will. My mother, my mother was Louise Little. She was born in Grenada, the British West Indies. My mother had very, very fair skin because her mother had been raped. See, my mother had light skin and long black hair and she spoke with an accent. My mother was an educated woman. See, sometimes she would write articles for the newspaper, The Negro World. See, that was the newspaper of Marcus Garvey. And there was times where she would bring us children and she would sit us down and she would read from the newspaper. Mostly, I remember my mother was always working, cooking, cleaning, ironing, washing, and fussing over us eight children. My mother was 28 years of age when I was born. I was born May 19th, 1925 in Omaha, Nebraska. I was given the name Malcolm Little. I was the seventh of eight children. When I was four years of age, our home was burnt to the ground. When I was six, my father was murdered. After the death of my father, my mother struggled to keep us together. But due to the pressures of the state and the pressures of life, she suffered a mental breakdown and was hospitalized. After that, our family was broken up. So I grew up in state institutions and boarding homes. I went to school. I attended an integrated school. All the teachers were white. Most of the students were white with a few so-called Negroes like myself. In school, I was a good student. I made good grades. I played on the basketball team. I recall that one day I was in school and the history teacher, Mr. Williams, was talking. See, history was my favorite subject but I didn't like Mr. Williams. See, Mr. William, a white man, he would say when it came to Negro history, he would just say things like, Negroes were slaves and Negroes were freed. And today, Negroes are shiftless, dumb, and no good and he would chuckle and students would laugh. In junior high, I was one of the best students. One year I was elected class president, but in junior high, I recall one day Mr. Ostrowski, a white man, asked me what I wanted to be. So you have to understand that he had asked all the students, the white students, and he was encouraging them to be whatever they could dream of being. So when he asked me, I told him I wanted to be a lawyer. He looked at me very surprised 
And with a half smile, he said, Malcolm, you're good with your hands. You should think about being a carpenter because that's a more realistic goal for a nigga. After that, I started losing interest in school. See, our children go to school and they learn nothing about us other than we used to be cotton pickers. All these children going to school thinking their grandfathers and grandmothers were cotton pickers and slaves. They don't know. Their grandfather was Tucson El Overture. Their grandfather was Hannibal. Their grandfather was Nat Turner. Their grandfathers and grandmothers were some of the greatest people to walk this earth. It was their grandfather's hands who forged civilization. It was their grandmother's hand who rocked the cradle of civilization. But they don't teach this in their school. They don't write this in their books. They don't tell our children about the contribution Afro-Americans have made to this country. Right now today, they're still teaching our children that Christopher Columbus discovered America. And we all know that white man was lost. And he set in motion the Native American and the African Holocaust. So you know what I think about old Christopher Columbus. We gotta teach our children the truth. Africans came to America before Columbus. It was Africans in Egypt who built the pyramids in the first universities. Africans, the African Moors, took the light of civilization to Europe when they was living in the Dark Ages. And Africans are the builders of great nations like Egypt, Ghana, Mali, and Songhai. See, we got to teach our children the truth. And if they won't teach it in their schools, then you got to open up your own schools and teach your own children. And if they won't write it in their books, then you got to write your own books and tell your own story. You got to let these children know what Africans have done so they will know what Africans can do. And once they know the truth, once they know the truth, they will build and create a great community for African people. But you got to tell them the truth. Don't you want the children to know the truth? Locked up and locked down. In 1987, the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, in COBRA, was launched and it became the premier reparation organization in America. In COBRA created an umbrella organization for the reparation movement and energized the reparation community through an annual conference, public education and demonstrations in support of legislative initiatives. Another group established in April of 2015, the National African American Reparations Commission, NARC. In a group, it's a group of distinguished professionals from across the country united in a common commitment to fight for reparations, justice, compensation, and restoration of African American communities that were plundered by the historical crimes of slavery, segregation, and colonialism. In 1993, Chukwe Lumumba, Imari Obadeli, Nkechi Taifa published Reparations Yes, the legal and political reasons why new Africans, black people in the United States should be paid now. In 2001, Randall Robinson, political leader and thinker, published The Debt, What America Owes to Blacks. 
it aroused the reparations movement and makes a persuasive case for restoration. In 2003, Dr. Raymond Winbush released Should America Pay Reparation? He offers a comprehensive collection of information about the reparations movement. In her book, My Face is Black is True, Mary Frances Berry highlights the case of Callie House, a pioneer in the reparations movement. On August 17th, the birthday of Marcus Garvey, in 2002, Dr. Conrad Worrell, former national chair of the National Black United Front, served as the co-convener of the Millions for Reparations rally, organized by the Durban 400 in Washington, D.C. More than 50,000 people attended this rally for reparations. In 2003, Dr. Conrad Worrell joined forces with Minister Louis Farrakhan to create the Ndaba Movement for Reparations. The Ndaba Movement is a network of organizations, researchers, scholars, faith-based institutions, and activists in the reparations movement. Ndaba is an African word that means great gathering to discuss and plan something very important. During the year of 2003, Dr. Conrad Worrell hosted mass meetings with Minister Farrakhan to educate attendees about reparations. The Ndaba were held in five cities, Chicago, Jackson, Mississippi, Houston, Baltimore, and Atlanta. The case for reparations is very much a financial case. It is not strictly based on emotion. And we really need to emphasize that black American descendants of enslaved Africans are making the case that loss of life, the loss of payment and wages for hundreds of years is the basis of the demand for reparations. In this financial component, the first thing we need to look at is the business of slavery. In 1860, over $3 billion was the value assigned to physical bodies of enslaved black Americans. This was more money than was invested in factories and railroads combined at this time. In 1861, the value placed on cotton produced by enslaved blacks was $250 million. Major consumer goods, which were the basis of world trade in the 18th and 19th century, were produced by slave labor. This includes coffee, cotton, rum, sugar, and tobacco. Cotton provided over half of all U.S. export earnings. In 1840, the South grew 60% of the world's cotton and provided some 70% of the cotton consumed by the British textile industry. The prosperity of this country is inextricably linked with forced labor of the ancestors of 40 million black Americans. Because the South specialized in cotton production, the North developed a variety of businesses that provided services for the slave-owning South, including textile factories, a meat processing industry, insurance companies, shippers, and also cotton brokers. There are companies that directly benefited from slavery. They include Lehman Brothers, New York Life, Aetna, J.P. Morgan Chase, Brooks Brothers, USA Today, and so many others. This means that the financial benefits of the business of slavery extended far beyond just the plantation owner. An entire economy was built to surround and support the system of chattel slavery. The U.S. military used slave labor to build bases and fortification. The Army provided its officers with a monthly stipend to cover salaries for their personal servants. 
If these servants happened to be enslaved, then the officer could simply keep the money for himself as a bonus payment. This was a powerful inducement to purchase slaves. This adds to our case, the involvement of the federal government. And this goes far beyond personal responsibility, making this a national responsibility. Wealth, not income, is the means to security in America. Nicole Hannah-Jones, Pulitzer Prize winning writer for the New York Times. 250 years of slavery and 100 years of legalized segregation robbed black Americans of the ability to accumulate wealth. You can look at these factors as slavery, 246 years, legal segregation, 99 years, and then systemic discrimination, which still exists today. Now, even though we take this back to the time frame of 1865, systemic discrimination could really be cataloged as being brought into existence with the inception of the nation. And even though we're clocking the time of slavery back to the year 1619, there's proof and evidence that slavery existed in the country before then. Closing the wealth gap. The net worth of the median white family is 10 times that of the median black family in the U.S., White family wealth is estimated at $171,000, while black family wealth is estimated at $17,000. As the income and education levels of black Americans increase, the wealth gap has actually widened since 1949. This huge gap is due to the factors we highlighted on the previous slide. We must understand that the compound effect of wealth, not income, like was stated, is what has made this gap grow exponentially. Just as a person who buys 10 shares of Apple stocks today would never reach the level of wealth someone who purchased 10 shares of Apple stock in 2010. Other things that contribute to this wealth gap is the New Deal, which was implemented by FDR, that ultimately hurt black workers in the U.S. Also, the GI Bill. While the GI Bill's language did not specifically exclude African American veterans from its benefits, it was structured in a way that ultimately shut the door for 1.2 million black veterans who had bravely served their country during World War II and segregated ranks, according to the History Channel. Also, the Homestead Act, which transferred nearly 270 million acres of land almost exclusively to about 1.5 million white families in the U.S. In his 1859 book about Texas, Frederick Law Olmsted describes San Antonio as having a jumble of races, costumes, languages, and buildings. Today, the city of San Antonio is one of the most culturally diverse cities in America. With more than one and a half million residents, the mixed population and multicultural influences are Mexican, Tejano, German, Irish, Czechoslovakian, and others. With more than 100,000 African American and descendants of Africa, what is the African history and cultural influence in San Antonio, Texas? As I 
sit upon the train back to San Antonio and I'm moving through the missions, looking through the window and I see the trees, I hear the wind. I hear our ancestors saying, never forget, never forget. As I'm looking through the window and I'm trying to wonder and see, I realize that it was our ancestors, those ones who took that original route, that original flow, that now lets me let you know how free that I am. Because the free that there wasn't, that escape that had to happen, I had to let you know that San Antonio was more than just the Alamo. San Antonio is more than just the river. It's a heartbeat. Do you hear the drum? It's the heartbeat of Africans letting you know, never forget. Never forget. And as I move through this land and telling these stories, my job is to let you know that I can never forget. Ancestors, what do you want me to say? We were here that we not only used the drum beat to tell the story, but it was in our season, in our cooking, whether it was the music that we play or it was the dancing that we were doing, that we were here. We set the tone for San Antonio. Walk on the River 2.0, the African influence in San Antonio. Archaeologists, genetic researchers, and historians refer to Africa as the cradle of the species, the original homeland of humankind. The first human migrations began in and out of Africa. As a result of African migration to the rest of the world, humans populated the earth. Christopher Columbus noted in his Journal of the Second Voyage that the Native Americans confirmed black-skinned people had come from the southeast in boats trading in gold-tipped spears. In his seminal book, They Came Before Columbus, Dr. Ivan Van Sertima argues that Africans traveled to America before Columbus and that the African presence can be found in the Olmec civilization. The Olmec is the parent civilization of the Americas. It's the first great civilization of the Americas. And all the other civilizations of Mesoamerica, in ancient Mexico, Central South America, spring from the Olmec. Now, Ivan Van Sertima, who is my greatest teacher among many, never claimed that the Olmec were African. Ivan said that there was an African elite among the Olmec, which in my opinion makes the achievement of the Olmec even more significant because the African element among them was never that great, perhaps a few hundred at best. He believed at a certain time in history, perhaps 1000 BC, thereabouts 800 BC, I think even earlier than that, a fleet of Africans from the Nile Valley was um, got caught up in a current and ended up sailing from the Mediterranean across the Atlantic and ended up in, ended up in Mexico. It has been proven many times that this is very possible. Even on one of the voyages of Columbus, he sailed from West Africa. Apparently there is at least one current from West Africa that will take you to the Americas whether you want to or not. If you get on that current and you have food and water, you're going to end up in the Gulf of Mexico. Well, that's what happened to this African element among the Olmec. And they rapidly rose to the pinnacle, to the hierarchy of the Olmec world. They introduced the ability to move large objects in stone. They introduced calendars, advanced forms of agricultural science, even organized sport. So they're very, very, very profound. Evidence can be seen in the colossal Olmec head sculptures carved out of basalt bearing African features, 
Nubian soldier helmets, and Ethiopian-style braids. Now there are four sets of Olmec heads. That's what we know most about the Olmec, these massive stone heads with African features. And I've been able to identify 20 of them, examine them, touch them, would pick them up and carry them back to the United States if I could. They're just that precious. The first 10 heads are from a place called San Lorenzo. San Lorenzo apparently was the first city, the first urban settlement in the Americas. And then you have seven heads that are from a place called La Venta. And then you have the third phase, and these heads are around a place called Trezapotes. The first head that was identified by Jose Melgar, a Mexican scholar, 1868-1869, is from there. And then there's a companion head. And this is the head with the braids in the back. Next, this is in a museum in a town called Santiago Tuxla. In the same museum, just a few feet from the head with the braids is an artifact that the campesinos, the peasants who dug it up called El Negro, the black. And it's an altar, 12 feet long, kind of looks like a sphinx with a face so African. Most people who deal with the Olmec don't even mention it because there's nothing they can say. Even more than the heads, this artifact, El Negro, is more African than anything you could possibly imagine. I've seen it numerous times. So we don't know exactly who those heads represent, but we know they have African features. And again, the Olmec civilization is important because it's the parent civilization of the Americas. At one point, there were replicas of the Olmec heads on display outside of the Mexican Cultural Institute in Hemisphere Park in downtown San Antonio. And La Venta is also important because that is where the first pyramid of the Americas is. You can go there and see it and climb on it. The African presence can be seen with the similarity between the African and South American pyramids. In ancient Egypt, there are signs of progression from the original stepped pyramid of Dozer to the more sophisticated pyramids that now stand at Giza. According to historians, it would be impossible for any group of people to have built those same complex pyramids without going through the same progression. Professor Everett Borders noted the presence of completed pyramids in La Venta, Mexico, but the unusual absence of any earlier forms of the pyramids. According to Borders, it's a sign that Africans, having already mastered the construction of pyramids in Egypt, sailed over to the New World and constructed these dual-purpose tombs and temples in the Americas. And though the exact dates are not known, there is a clear argument that Africans, as well as other nations, traveled to the Americas before Christopher Columbus. Queen Tai, Queen Mother, Loyal. Queen Tai was a Nubian. She became the great royal wife of the Egyptian pharaoh Amenhotep III. Records show that she was intelligent, wise, self-confident, powerful, and beautiful. She served as an advisor and confidant to her husband and son. She played an active role in foreign relations and was the first Egyptian queen to have her name recorded on official acts. For her dedication and service and love, her husband built a shrine in a temple dedicated to her in Nubia. He also had an artificial lake built for her. Of the colossal statues built of them together, they were of equal height, meaning that her husband saw her as equal to himself. She served as the Queen Mother of Egypt for over 40 years. 
Lure and legend says that Queen Makeda and King Solomon were both wise, wealthy, and rulers of great nations. When Queen Makeda became aware of King Solomon, she decided to pay him a visit in Jerusalem. It is said that Queen Makeda came to test him with hard questions. She talked with him of all that was in her heart. And according to scriptures, Queen Makeda achieved her goal in her visit. It is written that King Solomon gave to the Queen of Sheba all her desires, whatever she asked, besides what she had brought to the king. So she turned and went away to her land. It is also related that the queen was awed by King Solomon's wisdom and wealth and pronounced a blessing on his deity. Solomon reciprocated with gifts and everything she desired, whereupon the queen returned to her country. Queen Nzinga, warrior queen, astute. Queen Nzinga of Angola fought against the slave trade and European influence in the 17th century. Known for being an astute diplomat and visionary military leader, she resisted Portuguese invasion and slave raids for 30 years. In 1622, as the representative of Ndongo, Queen Nzinga negotiated a peace treaty with the Portuguese. During the negotiation, the Portuguese disrespected her by refusing to provide or offer her a seat. One of her loyal and faithful warriors formed himself into a human throne for her to sit. He showed great respect for his warrior queen. When the Portuguese broke the peace treaty and resumed their enslavement activities, Queen Nzinga organized a resistant army for the fight against the Portuguese. Queen Nzinga she has been called the greatest military strategist ever to confront the armed forces of Portugal. Willing to fight for freedom alongside her warriors, she demonstrated bravery, intelligence, and a relentless drive to bring freedom and peace to her people. Inspired by the legacy of Queen Nzinga, Angola won its independence from Portugal on November 11, 1975. Ya Asantewa, Queen Mother, Bold and Brave. Queen Mother Ya Asantewa was an Ashanti Queen Mother and leader of the Ashanti resistance to the British. When the British attacked the Ashanti, kidnapped the Ashanti king and demanded the golden stool, the symbol of the nation, Queen Mother Ya Asantewa challenged the men to present and commit themselves to the fight for Ashanti freedom. She said, how can a proud and brave people like the Ashanti sit back and look while the white man take away their king and chiefs and humiliate them with the demand for the golden stool? If you men of Ashanti will not go forward, then we will, we the women will. I will call upon my fellow women. We will fight the white man until the last of us fall on the battlefield. History. There was uh, a point in history where we really acknowledged the queens of Africa, Queen Neshepsut, Queen Nzinga, Queen Makeda. Of course, these women represented leadership in the, in the nation, which uh, they got it. Uh, it was no question about the ability of the woman to lead a nation, you know. And of course, these women uh, had the capabilities, they had the training, they had the heart to lead the people and to care for the people and provide for the people. And therefore, the men and women of that nation followed their leadership. And I think this is important because it speaks sort of to the fact that, yeah, the base of the woman may be in the home, but it's the woman's place is everywhere where her talents and her skills and her intellect can carry her to help her contribute to the society. And there was many times in African history that it was the black woman that was leading the nation, you know? And I think it's a great lesson to learn from that is because there are some great women today who are, have the same talent, the same ability, the same qualities that can help lead and are leading this uh, 
our, our community. Queen Nana, mother of the Maroons, knowledge and creative. Queen Nana was a well-known leader of the Jamaican Maroons in the 18th century. Nana was born in Ghana, West Africa, into the Ashanti tribe. She was brought to Jamaica as an enslaved African by the British. The Maroons were African freedom fighters that escaped slavery and established free townships in the hills of Jamaica. Queen Nana was the military leader of the Windward Maroons. She was a master of guerrilla warfare and trained Maroon troops in the art of camouflage. By 1720, Nana had her people settled and controlled in a free area called Nana Town. Queen Nana is credited with being the single figure who united the Maroons across Jamaica and played a major role in the preservation of African culture and knowledge. She served as a physical and spiritual healer to her community. Queen Nana possessed wide knowledge of herbs and other traditional healing methods practiced by Africans. Queen Nana, the mother of Jamaica, is a national hero. The government of Jamaica declared Queen Nana a national hero in 1976. Jamaica gained its independence on August 5, 1962. Harriet Tubman, freedom fighter, spiritual, AKA Moses, General Tubman, a self-emancipated enslaved African, conductor of the Underground Railroad, Union spy, army scout, and nurse. After she escaped slavery in 1849, Harriet Tubman returned to the South over 19 times to rescue more than 300 enslaved Africans. She successfully freed all her family and never lost a single passage during any of her escapes. Harriet Tubman said, I freed a thousand slaves. I could have freed a thousand more if they only knew they were slaves. At the age of 15, Harriet Tubman was hit in the head with a two pound lead weight by an enslaver. She almost died and suffered sleep fits the rest of her life. As she recovered, Harriet Tubman grew into a very spiritual person with a great love for God and humanity. She initially prayed that God would change the heart of the slave master. Later on, she said she changed her prayer. She said, oh Lord, if you ain't never gonna change that man's heart, kill him, kill him Lord, and take him out of the way. She said, I had reasoned this out in my mind. There was one or two things I had a right to, liberty or death. If I could not have one, I would have the other. Harriet Tubman was married to John Tubman. John Tubman was a free man. Harriet Tubman loved her husband, but Harriet Tubman wanted to be free. She left her husband for freedom. When she had crossed the line to freedom, she said, I felt like I was in heaven, but there was no one there to welcome me to the land of freedom. I was a stranger in a strange land my father, mother, brothers, sisters, friends were enslaved, but I was free and they should be free. She helped to free her entire family. During the Civil War, she served as a scout and nurse. After the Civil War, she built a home for the poor and elderly. As we were talking about the black athlete in early America, particularly during the period where now we're coming out of the period of enslavement, 
after the period of Reconstruction, uh, there were three main areas in which I saw black athletes evolve and grow. Uh, one was in horse racing. Many of the first uh, jockeys were black. African American jockeys were a huge part of the very first Kentucky Derby in 1875. Thirteen of the 15 jockeys were African American. And of course, the race was won by an African American jockey, Oliver Lewis. Uh, even beyond that, 15 of the first 28 runnings of the Kentucky Derby were won by African American jockeys. In the 1800s, the institution of slavery created a workforce that helped make Kentucky the center of the horse racing universe. The slaves were taking care of the horses uh, in all facets. That included being jockeys. So the original jockeys were slaves. Uh, you'll hear names like Simon, a very prominent slave jockey who rode a horse named Haney's Maria, who beat General Andrew Jackson's horses on several occasions. And it continued as we get past the Civil War in 1865. Without the black jockeys, there would have been very little racing in Kentucky. And Kentucky became the mecca of uh, African-American jockeys. Willie Sims was from Georgia, Alonzo Clayton was from Kansas, but they all came into Kentucky to gain their reputation. Well, when we look at some of the jockeys that dominated the very earliest Kentucky Derbies, uh, Jimmy Winkfield, who won two Kentucky Derbies, Isaac Murphy is probably the name that you're gonna hear most associated with uh, dominant jockeys in the early Kentucky Derby. Uh, not only was he, he was one of the greatest jockeys really of all time and is still recognized as such, the first jockey to win three Kentucky Derbies and was the very first jockey to be admitted to Racing's Hall of Fame in 1955. Needless to say, of course, this drew the attention of, you know, the white world. And, and that was a question raised, well, why let these black jockeys or these black men make this kind of money? That money should be made by white men. So soon after, uh, black jockeys were pushed out uh, through union, through uh, threats, you know, through violence. And basically, it was reported that uh, from, I think, by 1920 up to 2000, there was no uh, black jockeys in most of the major races, particularly in the Kentucky Derby. And then, of course, you had the other sport of cycling. Uh, it was a gentleman uh, by the name of uh, Major Taylor. Uh, of course, at a young age, started riding a bike around age of 18, introduced to cycling, and became very successful. Set about seven world records, uh, a world champion. And uh, needless to say, this, uh, this was a base of white sports and some of the races uh, it's reports that I mean of course he was threatened people would throw things at him as he rode his bike and it was one occasion where uh, another white a white rider uh, basically jumped off his bike knocked him over and choked him you can see that uh, though he was being he was very successful you know he it was under great duress and great threats and great uh, challenges. So he wasn't just challenged in the race, it was just the fact that he was challenged by racism. And then, of course, you had in boxing. At that time, uh, of course, you had the heavyweight championship, which was really, you know, the prize trophy of sporting. And, of course, you, Jack Johnson comes along. Jack Johnson, of course, uh, born in Galveston, Texas. Uh, his parents had been enslaved. Well, initially they didn't want uh, White fighting for the world championship, but he eventually got a fight and, and won, and won the world championship. Of course, uh, this was uh, very threatening because the world championship was seen as a belt of white supremacy. So they didn't want Jack Johnson being, you know, uh, champion and threatening their, you know, throne. Well, needless to say, another issue 
they had with Jack Johnson. He had relationship with white women. And of course, this was a period of time, in the, it's talking about the early 1900s, uh, where in these kind of relationships, it was really illegal. Miscegenation was illegal. And, but yet, you know, he continued to live that life and actually married a few uh, white women, a couple of white women. Well, uh, it was interesting because in 1910, uh, they called a gentleman out of retirement. I think his name was Jeffries. And he had been world champion. And of course, they saw him as the great white hope and they wanted him to come out of retirement and beat this black man back in, you know, to submission. Uh, needless to say, in 1910, when they fought, uh, Jack Johnson won. And it's not talked about, but that was one of some of the first race riots in America at that time. Because after Jack Johnson won, uh, blacks celebrated. They had parades, you know, to recognize this great achievement. But uh, the white society was not happy. And there was uh, race rise, they say, over in about six states, or six cities. And, and that is estimated, of course it's only estimation, but probably from 10 to 20 people were killed and hundreds were hurt. And these race riots took place in cities all over the, I mean, pretty much all over the country. But this was the reaction of white America to this black man winning this you know, boxing match. Finally, what they was able to do, they uh, charged Jack Johnson with a crime. And his crime was transporting a, a white woman across state lines for prostitution. And that was illegal. Now, of course, that wasn't the case because this woman wasn't a prostitute because this woman he knew. But needless to say, uh, they charged him and they uh, found him guilty and they sentenced him to the max of one year and one day in prison. Of course, he jumped, he jumped and bailed and went to Europe and lived there for about seven years before returning finally to America. Of course, he did serve his time in prison. And uh, of course, the main thing is that they finally found someone who could defeat Jack Johnson. And when he lost, truly, I mean, that was probably a joyful day in white America. But the idea is that in those early periods of history, you see in these different areas of sports, these black men who not only accomplished great things in the field of sports, but they did it under great, great threats. Of course, then you had uh, someone like Jesse Owens, a great athlete from the track and fields. Uh, tremendous talent. He had attended uh, Ohio State University. Uh, needless to say, he did not receive a scholarship. And as a black athlete, he couldn't stay on campus. He had to stay off campus. Uh, when they traveled, he had to stay in black hotels. He had to eat at the black restaurants while the other the teammates, or his white teammates, you know, stayed in the, you know, in the facilities set up for the university. Uh, in 1936 Olympics, uh, Jesse Owens went to Germany and won, I think, four gold medals. Uh, he was hailed as a hero because, once again, he had demonstrated that now America, African American, but really American, had, you know, shown that America is greater than Germany and, and Hitler. Uh, the sad part about it is that when Jesse Owens returned to America, he had lost his amateur status because he was trying to get back to make some money. Basically, it was hard for him to find any jobs, very menial, menial jobs that he was able to get. And to the point where he had to resort to even racing horses to make money. And of course, it's a quote there that talks about how 
he said, well, people said, why can, how can you be an Olympic champion out here racing horses? Isn't that degrading? And he was saying, well, you can't eat gold medals. <laughs>